Hi, um, my name is Carl Vasey and this is a video book review on William Law's A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. Um, I'm not very good with videos, so bear with me. Uh, who was William Law? Um, he was born in 1686. Um, he grew up at King's, uh, King's Cliff um, over in Britain and uh, he studied at Cambridge and that influenced him. His tutors there influenced him. Eventually he would teach at Cambridge um, and uh, he was an instructor. He was a teacher. But a new government came in, a new figurehead came in, and his theology did not match up with theirs. Um, his view of the state's role did not match up with theirs. And so um, he, he uh, by, uh, by who he was, by what he believed, he would not sign on with that regime. And uh, they labeled him a non-juror, which means that he was not allowed to teach um, but as, uh, as I was reading and as uh, I was reading some other um, things on William Law, uh, he used his books to preach his heart. And so he started writing books. Uh, he wrote books on theology. He wrote books on holiness. Uh, obviously, this one pertains very much to holiness. Um, he's very, uh, well, he's very devout. He's a Puritan, and uh, he, he believed in being pious, he believed in being holy. And this kind of sets the stage for where he's at historically. Um, this is d still during the Reformation, still um, uh, certain doctrines were uh, being worked out in the church, and, um, but it's very high church, it's very uh, intellectually based, um, it's very monk-ish. Um, hanging out and um, uh, trying to figure out what uh, the practice of the church should be. And, uh, and so he starts writing. He writes this book, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. And wow, it is an incredible work, uh, a true masterpiece, um, and, and it has greatly benefited my life. So what, what does he write? Um, he he writes in a very um, direct way. Um, it's much like reading the Proverbs. Uh, his truths that he speaks of are blunt, they're right in your face, and uh, sometimes you kind of react to them, but they are good and they are essential to a, a holy Christian life. And so I just want to read a couple of them, if you'll bear with me, because I can talk about them a lot. Um, but I would like just for you to hear his voice. Uh, some of the things that he said, and as I was reading the book um, on my Kindle app, uh, I was able to highlight and go back and pull these out. And he says things like this, God alone is to be the rule and measure of our prayers, that in them we are to look holy unto him and act holy for him. And I truly believe this is a thesis of his work, um, that your prayer life, your holy life, may be your common life. Um, prayer life be your common life. I believe that sets the tone for nearly every chapter in this work. Uh, some other things. People try and show devotion, but when the service of the church is over, they are like those that seldom never come there. They are like the rest of the world, appear to have no other devotion but that of occasional prayers. Another one, there cannot anything be imagined more absurd, more, more absurd in itself than wise and sublime and heavenly prayers. The virtue and holy tempers of Christianity, they are not ours unless they be the virtues and tempers of our ordinary life. This is early in the chapters, but this kind of uh, speech, this kind of rhetoric, follows through um, the whole way. Um, another th a few things. For let a man but have so much piety as to intend to please God in all the actions of his life as the happiest and best thing in the world, and then he will never swear more. Um, some others that spoke to my heart. Because, because unless our heart and passions are eagerly bent upon the work of our salvation, 
unless holy fears animate our endeavors and keep our consciences strict and tender about every part of our duty, constantly examining how we live and how we are to die, we shall in all probability fall into a state of negligence and sit down in such a course of life as will never carry us to the rewards of heaven. And on, uh, on that note of death and kind of coming to heaven, he says, when we consider death as a misery, we only think of it as a miserable separation from the enjoyments of this life. Um, what was he concerned about? He was concerned about seeing God in everything, seeing the work of sanctification and holiness in everything. And so who did he speak to? He spoke to women, he spoke to men, he spoke to husbands, to wives, to children, to the clergy. He spoke to married people, he spoke to single people. Um, to those who had much, who had lands, he said, unless you use the lands for God's purposes, for God's glory, you are wasting your possessions. He also said, buying comforts in this world are good, but they are only temporary. That um, if we do not use the things to the glory of God, if we do not use what we have, and he did say, God blesses some others as tradesmen, and they have much. God blesses some others as just being um, uh, unemployed, was actually the term that he used. Um, and God can see that, but they are to, to devote themselves to a more pious life, and even further above pious life. But he said, uh, if, if you use your things for waste, if you buy stuff for simple pleasures then um, you are wasting your resources. You are wasting God's favor in your life. Um, and, and there's just no place for it. Um, some other things, and I mentioned he appealed to the clergy. Um, this book, it reaches everyone. It, um, even the high church in his day, he was calling out the people that said he couldn't teach. He was calling out um, the clergy and saying that before you can teach others to be holy and pious, you need to be holy and devout and pious and one with the Lord yourself. Before you can teach others, you need to, to accept the Lord's thumb in your life. You need to accept um, kind of his work in your own life before you can teach anybody else anything else. Like I said, um, a few really good things about his book is he was just honest. It read like, like a journal, almost like he sat down and just um, poured out his own spiritual walk, the things that he encountered. When he was doing really well, and as a teacher, he had money, and, and he wrote about that in, in being a tradesman and using everything you have to the glory of God. But whenever they took away the one thing that he loved most, uh, teaching and helping others, and told him he couldn't teach any longer, he still used what he was given as a platform in glorifying God and bringing honor to his name. And those are several qualities that, that we need to see in our own lives. Um, one thing, really was not much um, wrong with the book. Um, there isn't really much uh, disagreement that I have with the book, other than maybe that some of, the, um, some of the things that he mentioned were very, almost unattainable, um, which if we truly lived a Christian, a holy, a pious life every day of our lives and devoted ourselves wholly to God, then it shouldn't be unattainable. But unfortunately, we live in a sin-ridden world and uh, we still suffer for, from, uh, the, from Satan, from our own flesh, um, from our own desires. And so some of the qualities that he would like to see in other people um, are just not very practical. Um, uh, to an extent. Um, one example of that is you can become lazy if you 
don't believe that you can walk with the Lord. You can become lazy if you don't believe that you can give up everything that you have to serve the Lord or use everything that you have over to the Lord. If I can't use one thing, then I, I'm just not going to give in. Whereas uh, Law's book says God doesn't just want one thing. He wants all of you. He wants the whole package. Um, and and that's kind of where he's coming from. Um, who did this impact? Uh, that's a very good question. And I, I love that it's part of the book review. Um, and you find William Law heavily in the Methodist tradition with John Wesley, with Charles Wesley. Um, I was doing reading on my own and many people hearken back to William Law, not only this work, but his other works as well, of saying we learned so much from him from just living out the faith that we were trying to figure out in our minds. We, we do our study and, and this is how we live it out. John Wesley says there's very few works that will um, be above this work. There are very few works that will equal in measure to how much this book impacted my life. And um, John Wesley, father of um, the Methodist Church, obviously he's had a great impact on Christianity. And so um, that is how uh, that kind of worked out. Um, my personal notes, um, what, uh, what would I build off of this book? Um, it's very relevant, relevant to our day and time today. Uh, when I was reading it, I almost came to tears a couple times because it was like he was looking right into my life, right into my day to day of things that I struggle with. And so I would highly encourage anyone re watching this um, to read his book and to take what he says very seriously. Um, he does write in a different style. Uh, there's semicolons everywhere, um, and some things are just spelled differently. But once you get past that, you see a very fluid language. You see a very beautiful language um, of this uh, sweet, sweet book, sweet man, really. Um, so I would highly encourage it. I would highly encourage us as ministers to read it and to adopt it and to put it in our daily practice. Um, and even for lay people, um, man, this work will convict you. As one uh, reader said, it convicted me on one page and I didn't think that he could say anything else to the issue. And then I turned the next page and, and it hit me again. He said something again that just got right to my heart. And so reads this book, one page after another, like I said, much like the Proverbs, simple truths, but exact truths. And not just short, pithy statements, but he expands them and shows how, how this plays out in our normal, everyday life. So, thank you. That's uh, William Law, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life.